answer. There it is. Hello, all. Um, thank you so much for, for tuning in. Um, it's bright and early out here, uh, Pacific time. <laughs> uh, but Michelle, I know that you're, you've got a little bit uh, later into your Saturday. So thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, I'll kick things off. My name is Kellen Patey I'm with ruralorganizing.org, and I'm joined by my colleague and coworker, Michelle. Um, Michelle, I'm wondering if you would want to just introduce yourself before we dive in. Sure. Um, so my name is Michelle Novak. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am now with Rural Organizing. Um, in 2020, I was a candidate for state representative here in Ohio. Um, I currently serve on the Middletown City School District Board of Education. I'm in my second term there um, and also hold several other leadership roles and some statewide roles um, within the education sphere. Um, I have four children. <laughs> I think that's important uh, because I was a candidate and mother at the same time. Um, and I did participate in the exit interviews that Kellen had um, implemented. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks for that. Um, and yeah, so my, my name is Kellen Pady. I'm, I, um, I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I had the privilege of meeting Michelle while I was uh, still working and living in um, Newark, Ohio. Uh, originally, I was an adult educator, uh, and I joined the ruralorganizing.org team in 2019, um, and I've been on board ever since. Um, and what we've brought with you today is a body of research that is um, that we conducted about a year ago, but is uh, particularly relevant um, as we're getting warmed up for the 2022 cycle. Um, at the end of the 2021 electioneering season, ruralorganizing.org um, wanted to make a strategic intervention in sort of a business as usual practice of sort of shutting down shop for a campaign immediately after election day without collecting the lessons learned um, along the campaign trail. And so we spent sort of the winter season um, scheduling interviews with uh, rural engagement leaders who were extremely generous with their time. Um, we conducted 70 hour long exit interviews to capture what worked, what didn't in 2020, and then what advice do all of these leaders have for people who want to do rural engagement in 2022. Um, so we're going to get into some of the wisdom that was shared with us, some of how we did the exit interviews, um, and then a little bit about um, what uh, what ruralorganizing.org did with that information. Um, I actually want to begin by saying, if you, we'll, 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 there's another slide containing our emails, <laughs> but if you are interested in reaching out to Michelle or I um, after this presentation. You can contact Michelle at Michelle at ruralorganizing.org or me, Kellen at ruralorganizing.org. Do with those emails uh, what you will. Um, and then I wanted to say just a little bit about ruralorganizing.org for those who aren't familiar. Um, we are a national 501c3, 501c4, and we have an affiliate super PAC uh, called ruralvote.org. Um, and our work sort of boils down into three main buckets. Uh, the first is advancing rural policy. We uh, design and lobby for rural progressive legislation. Um, we shift rural paradigms, we research and um, influence rural public opinion with strategic messengers and messages. Um, and then we build rural power. Uh, and that is um, developing local progressive civic leaders in rural communities and working to elect rural progressive champions. Um, <clears throat> so I also wanna give everyone just two quick definitions that we are gonna, um, definitions to terms that we're gonna be throwing around today. The first is uh, the term civic infrastructure. We use this a lot. Um, and when we say civic infrastructure, what we mean is local messengers using local messages to engage local people through local means to solve local problems emphasis on the local. Um, and then when we say rural prosperity, um, sort of what that is, is code for local assets, resources, and labor, building local wealth and opportunities on an equitable basis for local people. Again, local is a favorite word, but I don't think we need to define it. <laughs> 
Um, and a breakdown of just today's agenda. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about why we conducted our 2020 exit interview campaign, how we conducted the exit interviews, what we learned. Um, and then I do want to have a robust Q&A portion of this. I know that we're not joined in a Zoom room today or something like that, but please use the chat. And if, as you have questions, throw them in there on a, on a rolling basis. We'll take stack um, and questions will be first come, first serve. So if you have a question, throw it in the chat and we'll make sure it gets asked. All right. Um, Michelle, anything to add to that? uh <laughs> context not right now no but i will jump in as you're going through it please do please do okay so why exit interviews <laughs> um again so the reason that we chose to embark on this campaign was to disrupt some of the business as usual campaign dynamics um closing up shop without collecting feedback on tactics and how well things actually worked on the ground from the people who are talking to voters um, often these insights never make it back to HQ and campaign plans get sort of reinvented without collecting uh, really valuable insights. Um, instead, media pundits develop their own analysis and political strategists adopt it and share it with philanthropists who in turn invest in plans that aren't informed by that on the ground experience. Um, and so here's a little bit about uh, how we built our research campaign to intervene. Um, so we, oh, I want to jump in there too, though, because oh, that sorry. last bullet point that nobody actually talks to the candidates after the elections is completely true. <laughs> um, so, um, Kellen was the only one that only person, only, um, organization that had reached out to me. Um, and you know, I have a background in strategic planning and community advocacy. So, um, you know, it, it was really good for me that someone was collecting that and also to see what other organizers were saying and if we were saying the same things. Yeah. And this is a good, it's a good prompt because we totally recommend if you're planning a 2022 campaign, do some exit interviews. We'd be happy to share the template that we used. Um, it's extremely productive. Um, and so here's a little bit about how we um, uh, conducted this, this project. Uh, we hired a team of three interviewers all of whom were um, involved with our 2022 uh, GOTV campaigns, and we wanted to re-involve in our evaluation. Um, we The interview template was based on uh, sort of 60-minute windows. We conducted the interviews all over Zoom. The interviews consisted of 22 questions, um, and the responses were recorded and then coded to map patterns and trends. Um, this wasn't perfect sociology by any means, but we did have uh, a friend of the organization who's a PhD sociologist um, shape it so that we could rely on the qualitative data and, and stand by it. Um, and then we uh, compiled it into a report that was published on um, March 5th. And you can find that resource at ruralorganizing.org slash resources. Um, so here's a little bit about who we interviewed. Uh, we conducted 70 total interviews across 31 states. Um, 20 of our interviewees were uh, representing communities of color. Um, 32 electoral campaigns were represented, 16 501c3 organizations, 18 501c4 organizations, five PACs, three clubs, and two unions. Um, and here's what they told us. Kellen, before you move on, um, Ed Trevor in the chat said, um, I would think civic infrastructure would be more than just the messaging. And I hope you oh, speak yeah. more than that. Um, yes. Are you going to speak to that some more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get down. That's a that's a really good question. Um, and we're going to we're going to circle back to what this advice looks like in practice. Um, but thank you for that. And thanks for flagging that, Michelle. Um, so what we learned from our interviews, um, so first <laughs> electioneering can't fix civic infrastructure and let me, this is a great opportunity to, to touch on that question a little bit. Um, rural candidates can't do it all. Michelle can, can't do it all. She can do a whole lot, <laughs> but there <laughs> is enough time to build both civic infrastructure and set up a campaign and mobilize voters. 
the missing civic infrastructure is best built by local organizations running issue campaigns. And just so to give a concrete example of uh, how this, um, I'm sorry, how this phenomenon manifested on the campaign trail. In urban areas where there's strong progressive civic infrastructure, volunteer recruitment for progressive campaigns is far easier. And there's longstanding coalitions of friendly community organizations that help mobilize voters. Um, components of civic infrastructure uh, look like, you know, community organizations, progressive faith groups, uh, and perhaps most importantly, expansive personal social networks um, where progressives know each other and the, the grassroots is sort of fertile and expansive. Um, in rural communities, uh, particularly after the decline of labor in this country, um, progressive community organizations, faith groups are fewer and further between. Um, and the social networks as a result that hold together that informal progressive political power um, uh, tends to dwindle. So there isn't the same established network that's ready and waiting in urban communities um, when electoral organizers arrive and when candidates like Michelle step up and say, hey, I'm going to devote 12 months of my life to this. <laughs> Um, and it's it's there there needs to be foundation that's built and it's so much deeper than messaging um, and it's, it can almost be a little bit meta to think of you know what it what it is really is it's these informal local networks um, of people who participate in institutions that facilitate civic engagement. Yeah, uh, and I have to say I was really surprised. You know, I had never run for a, a state role before for a state representative, um, so. I came into it and, um, you know, I wanted to build my team. Um, it took me about a month to find a treasurer for my campaign. Um, I couldn't find a campaign manager. Um, I used someone and then that wasn't working out. So um, there was a lot of gaps that I saw um, as I was getting into the process. Um, so I just had to rely on my own um, network and um, the talent that's in my own community, but um, there was a lack of training. Um, for the people. So we were all learning it at the same time. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Especially as rural communities um, become strategic sort of backwaters, even in battleground states um, that are most focused on running up urban numbers. Um, we say always that is super important <laughs> and we do need to run up the numbers in, in sort of um, major metro blue strongholds. Um, but it's critical to cut margins in rural communities as well, uh, as we see in battleground states like um, Wisconsin and Ohio and North Carolina and others. Um, let me actually zoom ahead to our, our second finding here, um, because it's very much connected, <laughs> uh, is that rural leaders need a seat at the table. Uh, the people who are designing national and statewide rural engagement strategies aren't involving rural leaders. And again, this is this is not <laughs> ruralorganizing.org sort of pulling this out of nowhere. This is us talking to 70 people and saying, hey, so did anyone follow up with you? And then, hey, did anyone involve you on the front end of designing this strategy to mobilize your community? And the answer is often no for both. Um, and the result is unrealistic campaign timelines, out of touch metrics and faulty tactics and weak messages too. Um, that are not informed by the realities of um, the challenges, but also some of the assets of rural organizing as well. Um, and then our, our third biggest, biggest finding here is that Democrats are missing uh, local platforms in rural communities. Candidates are running on national agendas handed down from national and statewide institutions while failing to engage on key local rural issues. Um, candidates are turning to consultants and not politic, not local civic leaders and organizers for issues to include in their platforms. Um, <clears throat> I think a, a really good example of this is, you know, when we would ask rural organizers um, what they were sort of told to canvas about and talk about, what did they end up talking about <laughs> when they were on doors? Um, there was a big difference. There was a big difference. And it would be like, well, so what do you, what did you want to talk about? And it's like, well, you know, we were told to talk about things that we were going to do for infrastructure, but we, what we really needed to talk about was like, we needed to be armed with talking points about 
what is going to happen in this town? Which bridges are we going to fix here? Right? Which hospital do we need to reopen here? Um, and then there's also some key issues that we found that rural um, communities and rural voters are still on the fence about who has their back on. Um, and those sort of include um, uh, opposing sort of the takeover of, of big box stores over local businesses, um, also decent and dignant end of life care for elderly people, um, overcoming the addiction crisis. Uh, just to name a few. Um, yeah. Oh, and also the, perhaps most importantly, ending corruption. Um, you know, we sort of think of Democrats and progressives, of course, as the ones who are leading the fight to end corruption. Um, but rural voters are still on the fence. Winnable rural voters are still on the fence. Obviously, unwinnable ones are, are not on the fence. Um, but yeah, Michelle, was there something that you wanted to say to that? Yeah. Um, so as a candidate, I was really just developing my platform as I went and, um, just, you know, I was told through my fundraising conversations to start to pull together a platform. Um, and, you know, I went into it as a school board member and there were a lot of, there was a lot of legislation around public schools, vouchers, um, and, um, and funding, just funding our public schools. So that's what, you know, energized me to even to want to run in the first place. But, um, you know, I couldn't just talk about education. There are a lot of other um, issues that were happening in my community that were going on in my community. Um, so it was just developing that platform as I went, but it would have been useful um, to know what, you know, to have a starting place with a progressive platform. Michelle, and actually, I'm going to write down my own question for you for the <laughs> Q&A. I'm adding, adding one to my list. Um, so those are, the, those are the three big buckets. Um, and I know that the, this is being recorded so you can refer back to them. But I do want to get into some of the recommendations that we have um, from this research, keeping in mind those, those sort of um, three key points. Um, so I do want to start with, and when we have recommendations for philanthropic institutions, elected officials, and rural organizers, and I do want to start with philanthropic institutions first. So first piece of advice from rural 2020 organizers to philanthropic institutions, um, we feel that the best investments that we can make in 2022's electoral campaigns are early investments in those state, county, and municipal level problem solving campaigns that are run by local organizations. Um, this is a, again, a critical piece for civic infrastructure building. When we asked rural organizers, sort of how, how would you spend 2021? How would you spend the first six months of 2022? That was the answer that they gave. Um, additionally, um, building on the previous recommendation, we feel that given our data, it's important that those investments are able to encourage collaboration between grassroots organizations and grassroots organizers and elected officials. So if done correctly, uh, elected officials will benefit by drafting informed policy and earning greater visibility in their rural constituencies and simultaneously organizations will gain greater credibility because it will look like they have access to people who are in power. Um, one of the most concerning cautionary tales that we heard uh, was the story of two organizers who were working on the same Senate campaign, uh, both described not being equipped with rural specific talking points by the campaign leadership. Despite requests, they were never briefed on the candidate's stance on really important rural issues that they were getting asked about by potential voters. Um, and the incumbent Democratic senator sort of lost the seat. <laughs> uh, when ruralorganizing.org went and looked up what legislation um, that official had been drafting in 2019 and 2020, we were blown away by how active that person had been on rural issues. The problem wasn't that the candidate didn't care about the rural communities, is that there was a breakdown in the communication between the people who were on the ground and the people who were in the halls of power. Uh, even though everyone was on the same team. Um, last piece of advice for philanthropic institutions um, is that we wanted to highlight that 
while, um, or I'm sorry, that rural organizing is tough and it can be dangerous for organizers of color, queer organizers, women. Um, we want to build, if we want to build civic infrastructure and we want to commute, um, I'm sorry, and that we want to mobilize the communities who we want to mobilize, organizations and campaigns must have all that they need in order to protect the safety and well being of their organizers and volunteers. Um, Michelle, I was wondering if there was anything that you wanted to say on this point. I know that this was really important to you. Um, and this was a piece of feedback that came um, particularly from, from your interview. Um, with the security? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it was interesting because, you know, I was checking in with the people around me quite a bit. Um, and, you know, we're talking about like when I win the election, who's going to support me as I'm walking into the state house and, you know, everybody on my team, you know, has a gun. <laughs> so they're all like, um, you know, volunteering to be my security team, because that's how they envisioned it would look <laughs> if I actually won in my district. Um, about the messaging also, um, you know, not being equipped to talk to rural communities about issues that are impacting them. Um, it allows um, the other party really to shape the conversation. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it the conversation keeps coming back to guns and babies, you know, here in my area. Um, so it, it would have been nice to, you know, have those strong talking points so that we could shift the conversation around things that are really impacting people in their day-to-day -day lives. No, no. Thank you for that. Um, let's, let's transition now to um, some of the recommendations for elected officials. Um, so key point is, as we mentioned multiple times throughout the presentation, uh, a robust platform is essential to winning rural voters. Uh, but a rural platform is something that has to be a lot deeper than just talking about ag. <laughs> um, according to our interviews, job creation, access to hospitals and affordable care, broadband connection, anti-corruption, economic stimulus, racial equity, education access, easy pathways to citizenship, small business assistance, affordable housing, childcare access, and clean energy were all mentioned more frequently than ag policy when we asked people who were talking to rural voters in 2020 what the important issues were on the ground. Um, according to those um, who are actually talking to voters, the job creation that reaches all demographics and doesn't extract wealth from local communities is the number one issue that rural voters cared about and were asking about. Um, if Democrats want to retain control of the Senate and House, we have to deliver on these issues. Uh, advice for elected officials number two. So together, organizers from C3s, C4s, PACs, electoral campaigns all told us that part of what was blocking their inroads with rural voters um, was that they couldn't point to specific sound bites, videos, or quotes when the candidates who they were supporting um, were talking about relevant rural issues. So it is critical that a winning rural platform deserves more than just a section on a website have to talk about it when uh, the cameras are on. Um, and then last piece here um, is additionally, we recommend that as elected officials begin drafting legislation to address these local issues, they do so in collaboration with local leaders again. And then when it comes to mobilize voters, those same community leaders are there to contribute strategic decisions. Um, and so all the work ends up being better. <laughs> um, and then again, prioritizing investments in local organizers are so much better than parachuting in. Um, you know, I think that one of the biggest, uh, you know, one of the biggest pieces of advice that rural organizing has for, for all campaigners is progressives are everywhere. It takes a little bit longer to find them in rural communities but the best investments from a field capacity are growing the skill sets of those local people uh, who are going to be there season after season. Um, and then we have some tips and tricks for organizers and local candidates. This is sort of on a, on a peer to peer basis. When we asked interviewees, Hey, what would you tell fellow um, worker bees often <laughs> on these campaigns? What were some tips and tricks and some advice that you have? Here's what we heard. Um, actually, let me say, I do want to be clear. We're not telling anyone how to organize their rural community. We often say, if you've been to one rural community, you've been to one rural community. 
Um, but this is just <laughs> this is just some general tips and tricks again. So first, uh, a good first step is mapping local assets, networks, and leaders and off years. Um, there's big differences in terms of messaging and platform relevance from the campaigns who did this local um, power mapping and this local outreach on the front end of their campaigns um, and those who didn't. Um, and so if there's there's still time, we are sure that there is still time, but this is a great chance if you are a, a local um, organizer or a local candidate, that foundation work starts now. Um, second, candidates and organizations who took the step of knocking doors um, to canvas local issues, again, COVID safe, um, came up with much better me messaging and much better um, local platforms uh, that helped them get past sort of the, the Fox News knee-jerk reactions um, that uh, can come up when you say, hi, I'm a Democrat, I'm running for <laughs> Ohio 53rd House District. <laughs> um, and uh, so another piece of advice. Third, when we ask rural organizers um, what they want to do in the future um, or what you know, what's something that you saw others trying that you would like to, many mentioned some form of deep canvassing. Um, and we feel like while it's important, many local organizers who actually participated in deep canvassing efforts felt that their work would have been improved by tying it more directly to an issue campaign rather than election. Um, while deep canvassing emerged as a good tactic for connecting with voters, it doesn't build power. Again, this is according to actual practitioners without being paired with um, something like a ballot initiative um, or, or a, you know, a local campaign. Um, another recommendation from organizers was to recruit strategically. Often recruiting one lights out community leader uh, is better than recruiting 50 activists who have the same insular social circle. Um, and then we found that several candidates reported that bombarding local media with press releases and op-eds actually ended up being more successful than they would have thought. Um, even in a local media environment that would seem hostile to progressive talking points and progressive ideas, uh, they were surprised by how badly these outlets needed the content. <laughs> um, and that was a piece of surprising advice for us, um, but we stand by it. Um, <clears throat> last four tidbits here. Um, when we asked those organizers how they did overcome hostility towards progressives or to Democrats, Again, I'm not saying how did you know how did you overcome unsafe situations, <laughs> but how did you participate in sort of the the civic debates? Um, we heard that humor, hyperlocal framing of their policy platforms, and accurate local information helped cut through some of the dis some of the disinformation and the Fox News knee jerk reactions. Um, that being said, again, it is important to keep in mind that not all doors in rural America are safe for all organizers to knock on. We can't send organizers into volunteer volunteers into places where they don't feel safe. And we need to pr prioritize personal security online and in person and pressure campaign and organization leadership to ensure the security and well-being of organizers in the field, especially those from marginalized communities, you know, to the fullest extent. Um, we also recommend that organizers and local candidates do their part in engaging with state and local um, and federal legislation uh, to exert power at the levels we want. We have to engage with the policy work, um, even if it feels like a set of new muscles uh, for many grassroots folks. Um, lastly, we'll just say, obviously COVID-19 wrecked a lot of really carefully laid plans. Um, but many organizations adapted by incorporating some form of a, of a mutual aid campaign into their efforts um, and came away really feeling like that was a fruitful tactic um, and felt like it helped the organizations and candidates distinguish themselves in the communities. Um, and it's something that, you know, these the interviewees who we spoke to said should really live on beyond the crises of 2020. So I'll point that out. Um, and I'm going to shut up for a little bit. And we've got a good, good break in our uh, good break in our slide deck. 
and I'm going to transition to tagging in Michelle for a couple of questions, and I want to get caught up with the things in the chat. Um, so, Michelle, first, I, I you know, I want to ask, like, this this was research that was done a year ago, research that you participated in a year ago. Um, how are these conclusions landing now at the end of 2021 for you? Um, well, I can tell you that it's still fresh in my mind <laughs> as I'm thinking about 2022. Um, and, you know, I've talked to other candidates and from rural areas, and there's a lot of trauma <laughs> around the whole campaign and campaigning through COVID. Um, so I would say, you know, um, a lot of the conclusions or most of the conclusions are, are very accurate and still hold true. Um, you know, when I think about going into 2022, really not a lot has changed. Um, so we still lack a civic infrastructure. Um, I know that the local party has been, you know, trying to make plans um, to address it, um, but there just isn't the expertise that we need um, to do that. Um, so, yeah, and, and Kellen and I have talked about whether I'd run again. And um, for me, right now, I feel like I want to be a part of that infrastructure building. And um, what that looks like is just um, developing a local PAC, engaging people in education campaigns. Um, because as a candidate, I was that education campaign. People don't know how state politics or local politics are actually impacting their lives. Um, as a school board member, you know, when we're building a new school, you know, we're hearing about, well, why don't you fix the potholes? You know, so <laughs> people don't even know, like on a local level, like who's responsible for what. Um, they don't know what's happening in the state house and how that's impacting their families. Um, the corruption that was there um, that really came to light in Ohio um, with the first energy scandal that was yeah. being unfolded <laughs> before our eyes. And that still really didn't impact votes. Um, for a lot of local candidates, we were um, basically running against Donald Trump. You know, yeah. it was <laughs> us versus Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, it was just trying to bring that messaging back to like, okay, you know, we had to distance ourselves um, from the national campaigns um, and, and talk about local issues. But, um, you know, our voice, it, it just wasn't being amplified enough in the rural communities. Um, and, and there was so much nuance to the issues as well. Um, so it warranted longer conversations with voters and it was difficult during COVID to access voters. Um, the data was bad because a lot of local candidates don't use the, the van data. Um, it's just, you know, yard signs are primarily what happens, um, very few. Um, phone calls. And so when I went in and I was trying to utilize the data and the resources that were available to me, they were outdated. Um, and so it was really up to the local candidates to be updating, updating research, developing those platforms ourselves, um, thinking about security as well. Um, yeah. you know, do we had, we would go out in teams. I really didn't feel comfortable just going and knocking on doors by myself. Um, so, and, and there were a lot of innovations that came out of it too, um, on social media and how to utilize social media, um, yeah. that I learned from other candidates in the state, you know, when we were all kind of comparing notes, like what, what's working for you. Yeah. Yeah. And then trying to implement those. And I want to, I actually want to, want to transition to like, what, what, what are some of the creative solutions that you saw either along the campaign trail or this year, um, or maybe even even creative ideas that are getting teed up for 2022 to address some of the problems that we've um, that we've sort of surfaced so far. Um, I think um, you know trying to organize neighborhood coalitions, um, you know just. Sorry, I, I'm thinking, I have to think about that. Sure, um, well, actually, I'll, I'll say some of mine while, <laughs> while, you're, while, you're, yeah, while, you're, while you're working to recall this early uh, on a Saturday. <laughs> um, 
I, I really thought um, I'd, I'll, I'll break it down this way. Um, in terms of a platform building standpoint, um, if uh, folks should really be following uh, the West Virginia can't wait um, process of building their uh, policy platform in the state of West Virginia. They had an extremely robust uh, local canvassing program that was designed to turn over the creation of their agenda to folks who had skin in the game at the local level. Um, there's some great resources uh, that Katie Lauer and Stephen Smith and others have helped to craft about their process, really worth looking it up um, for inspiration. Um, and then I also think that there is uh, one of the best communications operations that I saw in a rural community came out of the Rural Utah Project. They had a, um, a tribal influencer program um, that they deployed that was designed to just empower um, local social media influencers and communicators and artists on the Navajo reservation in um, southeastern Utah and also northeastern Arizona. It was really great work. They have a report that's listed on their um, website. I believe if it's under the news category. I checked it this morning. Really looked that up. Again, great, great work there and good inspiration. And then on a field end, um, I know that there was a lot of playing around with all these new digital tools in 2020. Um, ruralorganizing.org test drove many, um, liked pieces and parts of a whole bunch of different ones. Uh, obviously, there was not a perfect one. Um, but our favorite was a tool that was actually built by the Kansans. So not in one of your... Um, sort of like uh, poster child battleground states. Um, but the progressive movement in Kansas has really been, um, you know, rubbing nickels together and making some really cool things happen. Uh, and one of the things um, that is worth looking up is the peer to peer tool that they built um, that was called voter to voter. And it's part of the voter network in Kansas. Um, it was a uh, sort of a piece of a triad of digital tools um, that was built by the voter network uh, and the mainstream coalition um, that was actually, it's, it's the, the data input was not van, but it came from the, um, it came from the, the Kansas, oh my gosh. What is it? The elect Board of Elections. There it is. <laughs> I was like <laughs> totally froze up. Uh, it came from the Kansas Board of Elections. It was nonpartisan, free to use. But what it did was um, rather than being geared toward professional um, campaign organizers and to fully funded campaigns, it was free to use and it was tailored toward just circles of volunteers in communities all across Kansas who wanted to make sure that their communities were participating in the election. Um, it was an excellent tool. We found the data to be really, really accurate um, because it was being updated in real time by the Kansas Board of Elections. You could actually see if one of the people who you were reaching out to through the, uh, through the tool had requested a ballot, had voted by mail, um, you could view a propensity score. It was, it was awesome. <laughs> it was awesome and it was free and the volunteer teams who we were working with really loved it. Um, so yeah. Well, that's and why it's important to have people like you who can look across different regions and see what's working and what's not. Um, I know that some of those relationship campaigns were introduced near the end of my campaign. Um, and we just we didn't have the capacity to even figure out how to use it and implement it so that it would would go well so that it would work so we had access to tools but implementation became another issue um so it was almost like it was easier for us just to say okay you know write down the names of 10 of your friends and make sure they get out to vote yeah. <laughs> you know and to yeah. work with our our volunteers that way to follow up with certain people um, because we could figure that out much easier. So maybe like in the off years, um, you know, some of those innovative things that might take a little bit more to understand or implement, you know, mm -hmm. we could be training candidates and training campaigns on those. Yeah. 
And actually, I'll, I'll ask you one thing uh, more about this, Michelle, before we move on to to another question. But for for those who are watching, um, those are just some of our favorite uh, examples of creative solutions to some of the problems we've pointed out. If you would recommend that we look up a, uh, or, th or you would want to share um, a creative organizing strategy uh, for rural turnout from 2020 or 2021, or one that's getting teed up for 2022 that we should keep an eye on, uh, please throw it in the chat. Um, and then Michelle, I wanted to ask as well, um, before we move on from this, you spoke about volunteer recruitment earlier as being a particular trial <laughs> that's that's actually and, and it's something that i think you know was shared by so many people who we spoke to and you know one of the one of the one of those unique pieces of rural communities that is a challenge not an asset <laughs> is the isolation that a lot of progressives feel um and that was actually sort of what started ruralorganizing.org is we wanted an online community where rural progressives could meet each other, could network, could share support and resources and success stories. Um, and I'm wondering, um, I have some ideas about successful volunteer recruitment, but I wanna hear what worked for you or what worked for you and the other sort of slate of awesome women candidates uh, who are working in Southwestern Ohio in 2020. Um, I would say what worked for me in particular was my messaging. Um, that I was speaking about issues um, for people who had typically been left out of the process and ignored. And when I was able to connect with people through, um, I mean, I had opportunities to speak in public because of my role on the school board. Um, so I spoke at um, one of the events for Martin Luther King Jr. Um, for that um you know, the, the celebrations in my community and the conversations. And I talked about um, access to vote and voting rights. And if we're not fighting um, to maintain our voting rights, then we're going to lose them, that we can't just sit out and expect that, you know, future generations are gonna have the same access. Um, so just talking about how these are an ongoing fight and then how people can plug in. Um, so you give people options, you know, if. If yeah. you're busy and you can contribute financially, contribute financially. If you have time, give of your effort. If, you know, you don't have time and you don't have money, then, you know, just, um, you know, don't be a naysayer. Like, just, yeah. you know, don't tear people down, um, yeah. you know, and be supportive. Um, yeah. So it was just um, really having ways that people could engage um, that call to action that was part of um, a strong messaging campaign. Mm -hmm. and, and then volunteers started to come to me, like, how can I get involved? How can I, yeah. you know, what can I do? Um, and, and then, you know, it was important at that point to have a place to plug people in and engage them right away. Because if you don't, then they're going to find someplace else to get engaged. So that, yeah. that's what worked for my campaign. It helped me to build um, a really strong team of volunteers around me. Um, mm -hmm. But um, still, because that infrastructure wasn't there, we were creating the campaign as we went. And um, I didn't know like the field work that would be required later on. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. If I had, you know, I would have I would have um, from the beginning been a lot more organized to make sure that like, you know, I had people wanted to write postcards and I'm like, well, what are we going to do with postcards? <laughs> so yeah. but then we had, you know, a really strong postcard campaign at the end yeah, because yeah. that's what a lot of people could do, especially during COVID, um, mm -hmm. is write letters to, you know, their friends and neighbors about going out to vote and about, you know, having strong candidates. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good advice for sure. I'll, I'll, I'll also say, and I, I, I appreciate, um, Amy, we'll, we'll get to your question, uh, right after this, but I think part, Ed, part of the early investment um, that I think is key to make from just even from a tactical, maybe this isn't early in the way that you mean this, but I, I was just thinking of things that organizers said that they wished they had started earlier, um, was particularly for volunteer, uh, recruitment was distributing yard signs. Um, in rural communities, we know that yard signs don't vote. Um, not that massive TV ad buys do either. <laughs> um, but, when we ask people, hey, so like what, you know, what, 
what was working and what didn't? How did you find people? Um, using yard signs as a chance to identify vocal local supporters um, who you didn't know about or didn't know were willing to take that sort of step of, of you know, staking a flag on, on home turf um, was something that candidates wish that they had, they had opened earlier. We actually, ruralorganizing.org conducted a, um, a yard sign campaign uh, in support of Andy Bashir working with the Analyst Institute um, to see whether, you know, yard signs would vote, <laughs> uh, or how they would, how, um, flooding rural precincts with yard signs would impact the vote totals. Didn't have a whole lot of impact on the vote totals. Not gonna, not gonna lie to anyone on here. Um, but it was critical for finding progressives who were in these small Eastern and Western Kentucky precincts, um, who people weren't reaching out to and engaging as potential volunteers locally. Um, and so if you're, you're thinking of how to stagger uh, rural engagement tactics, that's a great one for volunteer recruitment. Um, and we have a toolkit actually about how, um, how we would have done it differently <laughs> uh, on our website, again, ruralorganizing.org slash resources. Um, and Amy, thanks for being patient. Uh, and for everyone else who's watching, if, if you throw a question in the chat, we'll make sure it gets asked. Um, but Amy uh, asked, so I'm curious how you think uh, the Democratic Party can have the greatest impact on rural issues in rural communities and um, what opportunities exist to excite or mobilize voters in rural communities um, to better align with progressive values. Um, so Michelle, what were, what were some of the issues that really hit home um, and, and felt like helped build some, some good bridges? Um. Sorry, I'm trying to follow that. What do you mean? Uh, what, what were some of the issues that, yeah, that you leveraged in your campaign, some of the local issues um, where you felt like you were really able to open some inroads um, locally? I hope, Amy, that's not too bad of a paraphrase. <laughs> um, go ahead. Um, really, it was just um, being flexible in my platform and being willing to listen to people. Mm -hmm. Um, because I would say that a lot of, um, you know, Republicans who were hearing my messaging, um, you know, where I was introducing some of the nuance to the issues, um, that, you know, and willing to change my position by listening to people even. <laughs> so yeah. it's just really letting that local community help to build the platform for what's best for that local community. Um, yeah. And I know we've said local a lot, but that's what it comes down to is I wanted to be someone who was going to represent the interests of my geographic region and of my community. And I wanted to lift up their voices um, and bring their voices to Columbus, not just introduce a, a state or national platform and say, this is what I stand for. Um, because, um, you know, there is this frustration that we're not being represented in Columbus. Um, yeah. And, and I think just being willing to listen, interact, and talk to people um, was what made the biggest difference for us, yeah. for my campaign. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great answer, and it's and it's one that a lot of the interviewees for this that that we spoke to share. Um, Amy, I'll I'll say just from the polling that rural organizing has done, and I'm realizing it's sort of a hole in this slide deck because it's a whole different slide deck on the 2020 polling set. But if you go to ruralorganizing.org/resources, there's a rundown of um, some rural issue polling that we did. Um, that we did in several rounds, actually. I think we did four polls last year, and then one in May. Um, and so please check that out; it will be helpful. Just off the cuff, um, what that polling pointed to, again, some of the issues that are important to rural communities that progressives can capitalize on, again, are dignant end-of-life care, um, flourishing small businesses locally, and breaking sort of the extractive corporate grip on many rural communities, whether that's sort of fossil fuel extraction or it's big ag. Um, or it's really low wage manufacturing, what, you know, what have you. Um, yeah, I would say also like that small business support economics, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I have a strong background or educational background in it, um, that was really impactful. Um, and then, 
you know, fiscal responsibility too. Like we can be fiscally responsible. And that was part of my messaging was that, you know, if you look at, um, you know, on a federal level, fiscal responsibility and what it looks like, most of the time we've seen it demonstrated by Democrats and not mm -hmm. by Republicans. Yeah. Um, so that was part of my messaging is that Democrats are the fiscally responsible um, candidates. And, you know, so while we're looking at supporting communities, you know, and we're also looking at economic development and how to be responsible with um, taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. um, and then education. Education was fairly Absolutely. Um, bipartisan. And people had seen that I um, had been involved in advocating for our public schools um, and which was a bipartisan issue in Ohio. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And I'll say too, uh, you know, there, and Danielle, thank you for your question. Uh, and we'll get to it in just a second, but the often we find that rural voters are sort of Democrats excuse to just like, wow, you know, the reason that we can't have nice things. Right. And the, the common sure. advice to just be, just be a little bit more racist or try and sound a little bit more Republican and it's BS. <laughs> um, you know, like there, people are just going to vote for the Republican then. We advocate always to be boldly progressive and proudly rural. And that includes not backing down from a bold racial justice agenda. You know, things like pathways to citizenship, things like, you know, ending, um, ending you know, the exploitation of undocumented workers um, are things that poll really high in rural communities and that are really important to not back down from. Um, again, and I'll, I'll say one of the things, you know, we, we did a poll in the middle of um, July last, last summer and Black Lives Matter protesters uh, had a higher favorability rating in rural communities than Joe Biden did and certainly than the Democratic Party did. And believe it or not, a higher favorability rating than the Republican Party. <laughs> so we need to let that sink in. Um, and I would say, you know, when we when we talk about a winning rural agenda, it's not a rural agenda that is that is race blind um, or is even moderate on racial justice issues. Um, yeah. And you I did mention equity at the beginning, so you know that was one of the important words. <laughs> so there was yeah. a lot of local local ideas, but the equity issue, and yeah. um, you know, and and how to talk about equity too. Like we can just talk about like in rural communities, what's fair. Yep. You know, yep. What is fair? And we can look at data that points to, well, there's an issue here. So how do we make it more fair for everybody? Yeah. And if you if you look at, you know, there's there's again, we say also there's more people of color in rural communities than there are farmers. And even of the people who are involved in farming, there's more people of color, <laughs> you know. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the, the farm worker population, I'm out here in, in um, Los Osos, California. Um, the the even the ag the progressive ag agenda is a is a racially just one um and then so thank you danielle for being patient um so michelle danielle ask is asking us um and from her experience doing uh organizing in texas um the and i think that actually the the question is a little bit higher up um I'm wondering if this has been explored. Trainings for volunteers and staff on how to talk to their friends and family and neighbors and break down some of the walls that we've been talking about. Uh, you mentioned that sometimes it uh, even came down to asking volunteers to write down 10 people and get them out to vote. Uh, but in the age of such disinformation, it's hard to get through sometimes, totally. Um, so is this something that rural organizing has done any of these relationship trainings? Um, and what I will say is yes and no. <laughs> uh, have we done any sort of formal um, relational organizing trainings in rural communities? No. But when we deployed our peer-to-peer -peer sort of campaign that was leveraging this tool in Kansas, those were conversations that our uh, organizers and the volunteer partners who we were working with were having a lot. Um, and again, when we, we did do, we, you know, included exit interviews with some of those people in this, in this body of work. Um, and when we asked them sort of, how did you, you know, how did you break through? What issues were you talking about? Again, it was like talking about the hometown, right? What, what needs to happen here? Who isn't delivering for this hometown? Um, and in a red state like Kansas, uh, 
you know, it was, it was the GOP. Um, and it was, you know, sort of little mini Trump county, uh, county officials. And when we asked, hey, so, but, you know, how did you frame that conversation? All right, we get it. You were talking about local issues. Like, what were you, like, what was your tone of voice? <laughs> uh, and they said, again, like, you know, having, inserting some humor into the conversation was something that people found really fruitful. Um, and again, I think that that's something that like, you know, when you're at the level of talking to friends and family is something that comes in. Um, I'm sure that there, there's also people who, you know, came from a standpoint of vulnerability. And I know people who, you know, wrote letters to parents, to fathers, et cetera. Um, but that's not, that wasn't a trend from this exit interview. So I don't, I don't want to like, <laughs> that's not what the data said. Um, anecdotally is it's something that worked, um, but that's not what the data said. And then I'll add to, um, <clears throat> Oh no, what was I gonna say? Um, when we, oh dear, I totally forgot. Michelle, is there anything you wanted to add while I'm trying to yeah, remember? Yeah, let me add. Um, so I think trainings would be a great idea and I hadn't thought of that on you know how to get volunteers or how to have volunteers talk to friends and family. Um, I, um, I actually went through a pastoral care training and it's about meeting people where they are. You know, you don't make assumptions um, about, you know, how they're going to vote because how they look or because they're part of a union or any other reason. You, you meet people where they are, you talk about, you know, issues that are important to them um, and you have a human conversation, <laughs> um, you know, and sometimes, sometimes you just end up at an impasse because you're like, whoa, you know, like me and my QAnon friends just can't talk anymore yeah. <laughs> because, you know, we get into the alien conversation mm -hmm. and, you know, from another planet, that one. <laughs> so, you know, but, um, you know, and, and some, you know, and, and Kellen actually helped me to put things into perspective too during my campaign is that, you know, there's some people who you're just never going to be able to reach. Um, so focus on the people that you can reach. Yep. Yep. Um, the only, the only thing that I will add is, you know, again, while we're, while we're throwing in shout outs for people who are even better at this than we are, <laughs> um, we, <laughs> right. we, we partnered in Kansas, um, with an organization called the neighboring movement. Um, I really, really recommend looking them up. Um, they, the neighboring movements practice, um, is a much more asset-based approach that, um, than sort of typical community organizing that you might find, um, you know, sort of out there in the world, I guess. Um, and their, their model is very focused on helping people to engage not just friends and family, but people who are in immediate geographical proximity, <laughs> right? Who, who have shared stake on the same block. Um, and the, the, the training and advice that they have, um, particularly not through a program um, that we had the privilege of sort of tagging in for the inaugural uh, class of the Kansas Animator Network uh, is something that folks should really look out um, and something that I think, you know, Danielle might have some good advice, um, for some of these questions and certainly who I would ask, you know, or who I would want to ask this question to, um, Oh, something yeah. else that I wanted to add to, I, yeah, we just have a little bit more time, but, um, you know, something that I had started to do in my campaign was these community conversations um, where we would just meet at a coffee shop and start talking. And some of the questions I would ask were very vision oriented, like, you know, what would you like our community look, to look like in 10 years? Yeah. Um, and we had a really diverse group of people as far as age, um, where they are on the political spectrum. And, um, you know, and it really brought us together around a common vision. And I think, you know, when you're doing strategic planning and that kind of work, you know, you want to bring in all these different um, perspectives and people who are going to challenge you. Um, so when we're just focusing a lot on individual issues, we can lose track of that vision. And I find that that vision is what really helps to bring people together. Um, so if 
I, I think even having like somewhat of a vision oriented campaign, like let's let's bring Butler County back. You know, we've been, you know, pushed down for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we have so much here as far as talent, um, resources. Um, if we just coordinate and utilize them well, then we can really be have that that vision. And um, I know the Ohio Democratic Party or the Ohio House Caucus, um, they have the Ohio Promise. Um, it's a messaging campaign that's very vision oriented about how people can be safe and yeah. secure and stay in Ohio and, you know, retire where their kids, they feel their kids are supported. You know, so it's just some of those talking points I did incorporate into my messaging. Yeah, an asset based approach. Yeah, that's that's probably another. <laughs> so you were using some of those words I didn't well, understand. Yeah, yeah, we'll pretend that that's the good comment that I couldn't think of. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so, Ed, I know that you're asking too. Um, how much were wedge issues mentioned in rural elections in your polling? Uh, we need to counter the messaging here. Um, I th I think that the you will find you know in the in the polling, and I wish I'm I'm I'm, I'm too afraid to go to jump to a different slide deck, uh, and I'm I'd be worried that I would either lose the stream or something would happen. Um, but Ed, I think that you'll find the polling to be really thorough. Um, things from um, uh, abortion messages to gun control to uh, ending corporate corruption in Washington, DC um, to, I mean, um, you know, to reducing police funding uh, and investing in, you know, community support programs, um, education, those sort of drastic, uh, climate, um, climate measures, uh, all of those were included. Uh, I think that, you know, I think that one of the, one of the things that ruralorganizing.org found from that polling, perhaps in, in some sort of summation was that, when we think of winnable rural voters, um, <clears throat> the you know there, it's it's not worth designing messages for people who are, you know, frankly, you know, sort of the enemies of justice <laughs> in in our you know in our communities. Um, but I think that for winnable rural voters, there are people who are still significantly a, a significant amount of people who are still on the fence. Um, about, um, you know, who are on the fence about things like, um, oh, geez, there's, a, I mean, you, you name it, like whether it's pathways to citizenship, um, whether it's, it's access to um, abortion, whether it's, um, you know, responsible gun control, um, you know, sort of a, a myriad of progressive bread and butter things. Those are those are key wedge issues, and I think it's a matter of strategic, um, you know, it's a matter of strategic conversations. I think that um, you know we <laughs> there, there's a lot of conventional wisdom that we are losing rural voters on abortion. Um, the polling that we have actually says it backs up a different view, which is that you know 50 percent of rural Americans feel like there should be legal access to abortion. Um, and there is a lot of work to be done to, um, I still think, come up with, mar marry the, the wisdom about local messaging, and uh, I'm sorry, sort of locally rooted messaging and talking about some of those larger national sort of news hour issues. Um, but I will say, the polling also shows that those are not the issues that are most important to rural voters. You know, when we ask rural voters, what are the most important things happening in your community right now? Or, you know, like what, when we were asking, you know, to identify what voters, rural voters support, you know, sort of most strongly, it's actually things like breaking corporate control and, ending political corruption in Washington, D.C. And um, I would add 
um, I guess perhaps those those were probably the two biggest category, like two of, two of the biggest. <laughs> um, and more when we you'll see in some of the polling that we did, when you know we asked rural voters um, statements like, you know, we have to end corruption in Washington D.C. You know, do you agree? Do you strongly agree? Somewhat agree? Neutral? Somewhat disagree? Strongly disagree? Um, you know, we found strong agreement. I think it was at like, you know, 90 something percent, right? Strong, strongly agree and somewhat agree. And then we asked those voters to, um, in a, in a later section, pair that statement, like who, who said it, was it Joe Biden who said it or Donald Trump who said it? And for those key issues, again, namely breaking corporate control and ending corruption, which includes things like politicians should be banned from being paid lobbyists. Um, rural voters were undecided on who had their back on the issues that were most important to them. Now, that's not necessarily the issues that get talked about in common discourse as being the ones that rural voters care most about. But those are actually, at least based on the polling that we've done that we stand by, the sort of things that we need to be talking about that Democrats haven't distinguished themselves on. Um, so I hope that that's uh, enough of an answer. And again, I would encourage everyone to please go look at those um, look at those resources that we have. I, I'm I'm hesitant to like misquote numbers and figures here, <laughs> um, but you can go you can go read all about it. Michelle, is there anything that you wanted to add, perhaps to to that question? Um, no, I think you've covered it. Okay, sweet. Um, I um, want to say, oh, I'm getting caught up on questions here. Um, not talking down to people, super important. Yes. We also say that the, uh, you know, sort of the BS sensor in rural communities is pretty high. They know when they are being messaged to. Um, and it's the absolute last thing you want to do. <laughs> um, and I think that that's, again, not just to tie it back. That's the reason that um, I think empowering local communicators is so critically important. Um, we find that often in rural communities, the messenger matters more than the message, interestingly enough. Um, and again, the tr the when we asked in our polling, you know, for trustworthy, how, how trustworthy do you find the following categories? You know, like you find your, your federal politicians, your fed, you know, sort of national journalists um, at like less than 30% trustworthy in rural communities. And you find people like local doctors and nurses at the very top um, at, you know, 75% trustworthiness right up there with your, um, local farmers and ranchers, which is interesting because again, like there's, there's, you know, less and less farmers in rural America, but there's still key local messengers. Um, so are local educators, um, local veterans and service members, um, local business people, um, and um, local law enforcement. Um, and actually, you know, at under, um, under all of those categories was local faith leaders. And so we, we think, I think that there's some conventional wisdom that, um, you know, sort of faith leaders are the, the end all be all, um, messenger in rural communities. Um, and it's actually, it's actually not true. Um, and so the trustworthiness was lower than we, than we had expected. Uh, and there's also less rural people going to church, or rural people going to church at um, less rates than uh, people in urban communities. So, yeah, well, that. that's something to keep in mind too about the messenger is if you know you're a person of color or someone who practices a faith that is different than mm -hmm. a lot of people in your communities. Um, you know, sometimes it's an uphill battle for a candidate to try yeah. to overcome some of the distrust that's yep. there. Um, whereas, you know, you have this, this golden boy, you know, who everybody mm -hmm. likes, um, who's yeah. running on a platform to, just to support the Republican party platform, you know, and, and so people don't go beyond who that messenger is, mm -hmm. um, to really think about what those issues are and what they're supporting. Um, yeah. so I think those education campaigns too, just to, you know, help people to work through like, well, what's important to them 
and will they be voting based on what's important to them in their yeah. lives? Yeah. And Danielle, I, I think, you know, I think that you're right too with the, the, you know, that making these resources and, you know, the wisdom from people like Michelle or the, the, you know, the data from, from rural organizing's polling is critical. When we, we, when we asked people, uh, particularly, um, you know, the rural organizers of color from these exit interviews and those who are in remote rural locations, again, for example, like the Navajo uh, nation out in Utah and Arizona, um, trainings that come to them were critical. Um, you know, when, especially when you, you have a community that doesn't have, you know, the, the civic infrastructure investment to keep alive a lot of community organizations that can pay people, you know, a day job salary so that they can attend trainings. Um, even, you know, fitting, squeezing in a Zoom meeting, um, you know, when you're a, a working parent, for example, um, especially on a tight budget, uh, is really tough. And when we, you know, when we sort of ask, so what, you know, like, what, what does the progressive movement need to do better? Um, bringing trainings to rural, to rural progressive leaders um, is really critical and making sure that those trainings are accessible to people who are um, not on a professional organizing schedule. Um, certainly like I have the privilege of being, for example, um, you know, sort of those, those weekday trainings, for example, or even, you know, sometimes a Saturday, Saturday, you know, training, um, those were really important. Um, I do want to just take the last maybe minute here and say, you know what, actually, we're not going to do that. That's, that's going to be too quick. Um, but I, I do what I would encourage people to do. Um, is if you're interested in learning how ruralorganizing.org is sort of putting into practice the um, wisdom and the mandate that came out of this exit interview campaign, please go on our website um, and check out the campaign for rural progress. Uh, we have spent a lot of energy this past year making sure that this um, the lessons from these local organizers have been incorporated into our policy lobbying efforts. Um, and that rural voices are heard as the Build Back Better stimulus packages are drafted. Um, and that agenda makes its way to the local level, uh, if it ever gets out of Congress. Um, <laughs> and then also that we are making sure that the investments in local organizers are going to be a priority um, for 2022. It's also, again, the website's a great place to go and capture um, more of the information that we've been covering on here um, and check out some of the resources as well. Um, so Michelle, with that, uh, I know we got just a couple minutes left. I was wondering if there's anything else that you would wanna add. Oh yeah, I'm gonna put up the slide. Um, could you, let me, yeah, I'll do that while you're answering Michelle, sorry. Okay, yeah. Um yeah, I just want to make sure that you all have our contact information again. Um, so feel free to reach out to us. Um, really, um, you know, the the research that Kellen had done is right on, like it's right on point. Um, so, you know, and it's a it's a long term process, you know, and so we have to be looking out 10 years. But, you know, we're hoping to um, just get the process started because it hasn't been done in a lot of our communities. So, um, you know, I'm optimistic about how things are looking and I'm, you know, we we're talking about how to engage volunteers, you know, you, you just put something together like this, <laughs> that's meaningful to people. And, you know, they're more than willing to, you know, hopefully people will be more than willing to get involved and, and do the work. Um, you know, if they see that it's headed somewhere, then yeah. it's going to, be a, that civic infrastructure, you know, that's the foundation for yeah. future gains, you know, and, and just building better communities. Mm -hmm. And I'll say too, just in the interest of capturing the wisdom from people like Michelle who are involved with your campaigns, ruralorganizing.org has started to write exit interviews into all of our fundraising proposals and campaign calendars. Totally recommend you do the same. If you're interested in learning how we did this and what we liked and we, we didn't about our exit interview process, 
there's our emails. Um, we'd love to help make sure that this is like a standardized practice in our movement. Um, and I'll just say thank you again to the, to the Gaining Power team for having us. Um, and yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for all the commenters. And I think we'll, uh, we'll sign off. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Bye now.